so just want to welcome everybody to our Startup Grind Fireside Chat with Anthony Chow. He's the CEO and the co-founder of uh, Igloo Company. Uh, you might have known them as Igloo Home, and then they kind of created two divisions and then renamed it Igloo Company. But uh -huh. Anthony, thank you so much for joining us at Startup Grind today. Thank you for inviting me, Curtis. I uh, appreciate the time. And of course, you know, hope everyone is having a good lunch and we can share some of the insights as we, you know, over the next hour or so yeah indeed you know so hopefully uh people got lunch whether they're back in the office or at home uh grab a beverage and uh you know can listen uh and hear your story about igloo company uh you kind of are a classic startup founder you saw a problem in the market back around 2015 you're an airbnb host and you face the problem of letting people in at very odd hours uh at, at various properties and there really wasn't a way to manage that without actually you know having to come up with some you know, either, uh, you know, going and meeting them or, or providing something kind of like the old fashioned way. You said, hey, there's got to be a better way. Uh, and that's kind of where the idea was born. Take us back to the beginning and the early days and uh, how the idea really formulated. Right. I think, Curtis, you got it absolutely right. Um, this was about six years ago, back in 2015. So mm -hmm. uh, I just got back from the U.S. Uh, you know, I spent a couple of years over in the U.S. in the Bay Area uh, doing my master's and I go back to Singapore. Um, you know, I, I spent about two years working in a telco in Singapore, essentially the largest telco here, Singtel. Mm -hmm. um, I was a data scientist, but at the same time, I had this spare property for my parents. Uh, and I, I thought it would make a lot of sense to rent it out on Airbnb and make some money from it. Um, so me together with uh, a partner, uh, two of my partners at that point in time, we were all, you know, big fans of the Airbnb platform, either Airbnb host or, you know, whenever, whenever we travel, we will stay in an Airbnb property. So we are very familiar with how the Airbnb, the home sharing um, system works. And at the, at the point in time, it was kind of, you know, maybe six, seven years into the Airbnb journey, right? Um, so as I started taking this spare property and started renting it out on Airbnb, uh, I realized that it was making quite good money. You know, we could do 50%, 60% ROI on month to month with, say, about 70% occupancy rate, which was kind of the normal. Uh, some months we get up to 90%. Uh, but with that, uh, you know, I, I felt that it was kind of a very good viable business model. And I was thinking about how do we go in about acquiring more properties and, you know, just build a property management platform. But as I was doing that, I realized the biggest problem actually for myself uh, was really passing physical keys to my guests to allow them to check in. And also to, you know, uh, my housekeeper uh, who wants to come in to turn over the property in between stays. So... Keys get missing, uh, keys can get duplicated, and sometimes the guests might just bring the keys back home to their home country and we need to replace the locks. Um, and so that kind of sparked the idea that, hey, you know, uh, there are, I'm not the only Airbnb host in the world. There are about 3 million Airbnb hosts at that point in time. Obviously, there's a lot more right now. Um, and, you know, many of them are facing this problem. Why don't me and my partners kind of get together and build an automated Airbnb check-in solution? Uh, and, and, and so, so at the point that Igu Home was born. So that was uh, sometime in August 2015 when we officially incorporated the company. It took us about six months um, to really get the very first uh, working prototype out into the market um, and got somewhat about 50 Airbnb hosts to really try the product and put the products on their door and actually welcome guests using the Igu Home product. So uh, after a couple of iterations, we officially launched the product um, sometime in you know May 2016. And so we have been in the market for about five and a half years. But really, once we launched officially, uh, we, we managed to get a good following of Airbnb hosts in several regions, uh, specifically around the um, Australia, Singapore, and the US region to really adopt the solutions that we have put out. And at the end of 2016, Airbnb officially partnered us as a global keyless solution. Uh, I think we were kind of quite lucky to be in a good place at the right time where Airbnb was really figuring out how do they scale up um, their supplies. You know, they really wanted to have, you know, a lot more properties available for rent. Um, and so uh, one of the biggest stumbling block was really the quality of the host and the quality of the properties. And smart access became one of the very important user experience that they felt would help hosts scale up their property management in a much more easier fashion. So they came up with a program called Host Assist. Um, and they officially onboarded about six lock, six to seven lock companies. We are the only ones in, in Asia Pacific um, and we onboarded with them and really uh, through that partnership, it helped us to propel um, you know, the, the product and the brand 
of a Google Home to a lot more Airbnb hosts around the world. Um, and we kind of scale up uh, from there. Yeah, yeah, and you have just, you know, you're in about 100 countries. You have uh, over 100 distributors. Uh, you know, talk to us a little bit about once you got that MVP in the market and that partnership up with, Air, or partnership up with Airbnb, uh, talk to us about, um, you know, how it was to actually go out there and get those distributors and, and really scale this thing to be a global solution. Was that something you were able to do or was there a lot of help from the partnership with Airbnb? For sure, for sure, yeah. Um, with the partnership with Airbnb, I think it was very clear from the get-go that um, being based in Singapore, uh, you know, Singapore doesn't have a whole bunch of Airbnb hosts. And in fact, through the regulations, uh, they were just about to shut down, you know, home sharing or, you know, Airbnb properties in Singapore in 2017. I remember that, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so some of the largest Airbnb, you know, host populations were really in the developed markets, especially in US and Europe. And the fastest growing markets for them were really in Asia Pacific. So like in markets like Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, and there was a large growing uh, you know, number of Airbnb hosts in Australia as well. So for our products to be uh, effective and to scale and to help Airbnb in their business, we really needed to scale beyond the shores of the sunny island Singapore, right? We needed a lot more Airbnb hosts in other countries to really adopt our solutions and to scale the supply for Airbnb. Um, so uh, we, I mean, at the very beginning, we, we didn't know better. So we, we thought that really by building the products and just shipping it to any Airbnb host who wants to buy the product uh, will, will work. Um, you know, so when, when during, the, during uh, Airbnb Open, I think in 2016, when they officially announced the launch, we brought some like 300 of our products to the, mark, to, to the conference. And there were, I think, 5,000 super hosts, you know, Airbnb hosts. They came by the event. So they came to us from all over the world, you know, all the way from, you know, Portugal to you know, Scandinavia to Russia. And uh, they were very fascinated by the product that we put out there. Um, so when they purchased, we actually shipped the products straight from wherever we were to them. Um, I think a number of issues that we faced, I think number one, uh, import tax and shipping costs and logistics was something that is quite tricky. Um, different countries have different you know, regulations around that. Uh, and I think one of the examples I can recall was for us shipping directly to one of our customers in Thailand, I think they ordered five or six uh, of our product. It got stuck in customs for more than like a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, and being, being stuck in customs also means that you continue to incur costs within the customs itself and it made the product, you know, prohibitively expensive, you know, by the time it got our customs. So I think that was one very big uh, realization that we had. The second one is really about localization as well. You know, there are many local languages and many different styles of Airbnb properties in the different markets. Um, and that also means that there needs to be a certain local touch to, you know, the, the, the market in itself. Um, and the third one is really after sales service support. You know, we don't want to be providing any 24 hour sales service. Support. Although we, we pride ourselves as, you know, good customer service, but you, know, you just can't do it for 24 hours. Uh, around the world, uh, you need local partners. So based on these three learnings, uh, we, we really set up to you know, identify good partners and distributors that can bring our products to the market and kind of you know, multiply our efforts within their local markets in itself. So we went about attending a lot of conferences and trade shows. So there are a couple of types of trade shows that we attend. The first one is consumer electronic trade shows, where we go there, put up a booth, Obviously, the largest being uh, CES, Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. Uh, that's coming back you know, in person again next year. So we're excited about that. Um, there, there are you know, a lot of vacation rental shows as well. Verma, VRMA, which is a large one, uh, you know, vacation rental association over in the US where they have multiple trade shows going on in different parts of the year. It's a very you know, focused and niche trade show, but it's the right uh, trade show for our market. Um, and also there are others uh, which are a lot more uh, you know, you know, uh, kind of, uh, how, how should I say, like more disparate, love. but, but that's where, you know, some of the retail partners actually attend to identify the next best product to bring through the retail channels. So I remember in 2017 and 2018, um, the team, the sales team, myself, we were really literally on trade show after trade show just to bring, bring the product to market. Um, I think in 2018, we attended more than 50 trade shows. That means one trade show per week in a different country. So uh, we got to travel around a lot uh, and, and, and identify, you know, uh, the, the good partners to, to, to onboard our product. And I, I think the way we incentivize these partners to come on board was really um, to show them the vision 
to show them that, hey, you know, Airbnb is a market that's growing very quickly. We have a great partnership with Airbnb and we have the right product for this segment. Um, you know, uh, bring, bring one of our products onto your portfolio and, and bring it to your local market. So they don't actually need to, uh, you know, uh, put a whole bunch of marketing effort behind the new product where we could already do the marketing you know, over the top for them. Um, at the same time, there's already a good captive audience of customers that are ready to use our products. Um, and, that, and that was that was how we got you know our first 10, 20 distributors. So all the way until 2018, we managed to bring on board about 40 to 50 distributors, um, largely across Asia Pacific and some in um, the US. And you know, we went from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, the statistics are fairly interesting, and the rise of Airbnb is, is you know a, a story in and of itself. And I, I remember the old days. I remember before the logo uh, that we see today, uh, yep. the old logo and everything. And, and you know, I'll admit I've only done about two or three Airbnbs in my life, and not, nobody had. Uh, the, the only one that had a digital lock was in Japan and, you know, the cleaner would come and I think change the codes out for each guest because, you know, you don't want a guest to check out and then still have access to the place uh, potentially when there's a new guest there. Um, and they were all doing that manually. I think one in, in the Philippines was uh, just, you know, traditional key and, you know, we'll leave it at the front desk of the condo. Um, right. You know, so it, it's really quite interesting because, you know, there is such a need for that to, to be able to manage everything kind of digitally. Um, but, you know, I, I guess the other question I have is, is how much of the business uh, is is really attached to Airbnb? In other words, right. as Airbnb grows, you know, does Igloo, Igloo company keep growing as well? Uh, right. Or if uh, Airbnb uh, goes uh, kind of in the other direction, which we saw during COVID, how does that also affect your business as well? Like, so how uh, attached at the hip are you guys to Airbnb? Right. Um, great question. So when we first started, we saw Airbnb as the beach hit for us to get into the smart access uh, space. So with Airbnb as a partner, we onboarded a couple of other partners in the vacation rental space as well. You know, from some of the large platforms in China to platforms in Europe, like Booking.com, which was also going to the Airbnb space at a point in time. And a number of local Airbnb property management companies across different regions like Australia, to Thailand, to Indonesia. Um, and so the vacation rental market was really the large market that we were going to because there was a pain point to solve, you know, helping them manage their operational efficiencies uh, makes a lot of sense. It, you know, it directly impacts their bottom line and at the same time improve the guest experience so that they can host more as well. So I think that was a very nice uh, niche market that we went into. We kind of stayed in that market for about two to three years, all the way to 2018. Um, and at the same time, we started branching out into, you know, um, other different verticals. One of the learnings that we had from the first three years of our operations is that the largest clients for us are really B2B. They are businesses. So it's not the individual Airbnb host with one property, but it's the individual uh, property manager with like 10 properties, 20 properties. When they are trying to get to scale, they're thinking of it as a business. So we started to you know, work with property developers. Um, there was a nice trend you know, sometime in 2018, 2019, where some of the top property developers across the region, um, especially in Indonesia, Thailand, where you know, they value a lot about hospitality, um, really they were trying to think about how they can sell the properties and also market it as Airbnb ready. So, uh, and not just Airbnb ready, but you know, like a very high you know, uh, user experience kind of uh, a smart home uh, product for their properties that they were trying to build. So we started partnering them as well. Um, and some of the top Thailand property developers today are our clients, where we, when they build up the entire property, they install the Eagle Home uh, products together with them. So we realized that, you know, probably 70% 70, 70 of our business came from B2B and we were looking for other, you know, adjacent verticals for us to go into where we could also use the product or, you know, uh, you know, tailor it a little bit and modify a bit uh, with the value proposition and go into other different verticals. So we came out with a vision uh, to create a world without keys. Um, and, and so we identified a few more other different verticals to go into. Um, and and, and this, this was, I think, sometime in 2019, where we realized that, you know, uh, not just in the vacation rental market or in the residential development markets, um, you know, in the commercial, market, there were a lot of use cases for keyless access solutions that we can bring bring to the market as well. So one example would be telco, um, you know, the cell towers that are being deployed across the country, they need, you know, maintenance staff to go and 
you know, repair or maintain the base stations within the, the, the cell tower or the utilities companies with pump rooms across the entire country or you know, the power companies uh, with all these assets that are maintaining across the, the, the entire country. And we realized that you know, uh, if we align ourselves up with smart cities initiatives that you know, across uh, different countries around the world, that, that could be a huge potential for, for the company. So we launched a new vertical called Igu Works to focus on this uh, effort. And what we did in 2019 was we organized the Singapore Smart City Summit. Uh, this was you know, probably our first ground up approach where we partnered some of the government organizations in Singapore, such as IMDA and Enterprise Singapore, to organize a very nice you know, one day event where we had over 300 smart cities practitioners from about 20 different countries fly to Singapore to share their experiences about you know, their thoughts about smart cities. And we launched Igloo Works um, then to, to, to showcase the capabilities that we can provide to smart cities uh, projects. And I think good timing or not, you know, a couple of months later, we ran into COVID. So every country went on lockdown. Um, and for us, with you know, about uh, 13 different offices around the world, uh, it, it came, I think, operations ground to a halt because you know, uh, there were so many uh, disruptions going on with logistics and freight causes. Um, and uh, I mean, in 2020, it was, it was kind of a year of where we had to reconsolidate and identify the strategy uh, you know, where we had a good business with you know, vacation rental partners, uh, which kind of went to ground to a halt, right? Because of all the borders locked down. And we have a new business, uh, Eagle Works, where we are trying to build up. So we had to refocus our entire team's effort um, and we kind of streamline it to, you know, I think we, we have three different verticals right now. Um, you know, uh, where, where we see ourselves growing um, in the next couple of years and beyond. So I think at the moment right now, to answer your question in a kind of a long-winded manner, uh, the vacation rental market has shrunk to a very small portion of our business. It's probably about 10 to 15%. You know, a large part of it really comes from um, some of our B2B segments that we're working on right now, such as uh, property management segment uh, in the US, also infrastructure management segments um, across some of the developed markets. Yeah, and that's a, a great point. You know, even through the pandemic and the the vacation rental market, that's taken a big hit. You don't have all your eggs in one basket. You were able to kind of diversify, uh, and that's kind of where that rebrand came from. You know, you had right. Eagle Home to start, which you know mm -hmm. the home, but you know it's really there's a lot of solutions, like you said, the cell towers uh, right. around the world that are deployed and maintenance staff that need to get in there. There's really a whole kind of large market, anything that's got a door and a lock on it, basically, which uh, there's, you know, hundreds of millions of those places uh, is a potential uh, place for your products. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, you know, that rebrand and, and how you guys came to that realization that, hey, we, we should call ourselves Igloo Company uh, instead of Igloo Home because we're going to have Igloo Works and, and Igloo Home. Uh, under this umbrella organization. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. And then maybe also just, you know, where the, the Igloo name comes from. Yeah, sure. Um, so with the with the rebranding, that was a conversation that happened in 2020 as we went into 2021 this year. Uh, as we think about the different segments that we are targeting, uh, it became more and more apparent and clear that we need a different strategy for the different segments, you know, from product development, to product marketing, to actual, you know, selling the product and also the way we bring the value proposition across to our customers, across the various different touch points of the business, you know, from the website to the mobile app, to the advertisements that we put out, you know, digital marketing efforts that we do. So, so we realized that, uh, you know, Igu Home was very nicely, you know, in a nice area where we could sell well to the vacation rental and also to the consumer market, you know, the smart home ecosystem uh, space. But as we think about enterprise segment, you know, the way we reach out to our enterprise customers and the way we sell the value proposition to them um, is very different from the way we engage the consumers. So Eagle Works became a nice umbrella for us to park our enterprise uh, business. But even then, we realized that the different enterprise segments have their own different value propositions and different product lines that we might potentially bring to the market. Um, so that, that came to the realization that we do need a parent company. Uh, so we came up with the word in the name Eagle Company and Eagle Home was built for a smart home. Um, and Igloo Works was for smarter cities. And we could identify, I, I, you know, come up with a few other Igloo prefix brands that could go into different kind of verticals that we think about in the future, whether is it, uh, you know, uh, let's say data centers or, you know, uh, smart cities initiatives or military, you know, oil and gas. 
And I think those are, you know, verticals that we have in our ice box that we are considering and we will launch them, you know, as time comes by. So um, I think that was a good strategic move. It, it gave a lot more clarity to our customer base. It also allows our company to be structured in a much more uh, clear manner with, you know, different kind of uh, product lines and different kind of sales strategy and uh, partnerships that we line up with. So, so that, that was, um, that was good. Um, and I think underlying the entire business really is, you know, the core technology that we have created, right? Um, comes coming across the firmware development, the Bluetooth stack, the security that we put in place, um, as well as, you know, the different integration partnerships that we do. And, and this underpins all the different, uh, product lines that we bring out into the market. Uh, the word, the, the name Igloo, I think we, we, we really, uh, I mean, right now, the way we talk about the word Igloo is, is that, you know, it is basically the home of the Intuit, uh, on, in Antarctica. So it's a very nice sturdy structure, you know, it shoots the Eskimo from some of the harshest winter and the harshest cold. So it portrays a sense of security. It portrays a sense of peace of mind and which is what we as a brand want to, want to, want to portray. But really, I think the unofficial story, uh, that, that we came out with the word Igloo was when I, when me and my partners first started the company, um, you know, we were very fascinated with some of the big tech companies like Google, Yahoo, and Facebook. And we wanted our company to be like them, right? In, in, the, in the next couple of years. And we, we looked at the names and the commonality amongst the names of these three companies was really that there were two O's in their names. So we, we figured that maybe, you know, if, if we do come up with a name with two O's, uh, it will be half the better one and we'll be on the path to success, right? So, so I mean, there, there are two stories that we tell them. But, mm. Uh, that coldness of Antarctica, I mean, you know, yeah. being in uh, subtropical Singapore, uh, you ne might not necessarily think of igloos uh, off the, the top of your head, but, um, but you know, it, it is true. I, I do remember when I grew up in Ohio, we had a lot of snow sometimes, and we'd go out and we'd make an igloo and like, right. sit in as kids. So, uh, and the yeah. things actually hold up very, very well. Um, so... I, I also want to talk to you guys uh, about uh, the fundraising journey. You know, you've raised about roughly 20 million or something, uh, according to the data on Crunchbase. Um, talk to us about when you guys thought it was the right time to go out there into the market and take outside money and what that whole process was like, because this is something that a lot of entrepreneurs, there's really no playbook or rhyme or reason. It, it, it's really just you got to learn from others that have done it. Uh, about their fundraising journey. So walk us through that and what that whole process was like when you were out meeting with potential investors. Right, yeah. Um, I think uh, if, I, uh, if I recall the very first fundraise that we did, uh, this was early 2016. Um, I, 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 I don't really think there's a good playbook for it as well. I think one of the things that we really got help from was because we went through an accelerator program um back in 2015 this was uh, out of philadelphia in new york uh, accelerator program called dream adventures so they they have a prop tech arm right now um and back then i think really was going through it uh, they had great network across the united states and we knew that the single biggest uh, you know partner that we need to partner was airbnb and they somehow had you know like uh, one of the connections that was working in airbnb as a head of operations so that really helped but beyond that they also you know had a number of uh, investors within their network from the LPs to other investors that they have, they work with together to invest in some of the portfolio companies that they, 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 they go through their program. So that helped a lot. I think, uh, through them, um, getting word of mouth out saying that we are kind of, uh, having a prototype and we do have a big vision and we, uh, have put together an initial set of uh, good people within the organization. And we want people to come on board to take a bet on us, um, because, uh, this, this market is about to explode, right? So I, I, I would say that um, at, a, at the very beginning, it's really about selling the, the story, uh, you know, selling the team and then working with, uh, talking to investors and giving them the confidence that, um, you know, while you don't have all the answers and you cannot see the future five, 10 years from then, but they can trust in you as well as the team that you have put together to execute because you will definitely face a lot of challenges and problems uh, along the way, which you might not have anticipated but you can, you know, go through um, brick walls, right? Run through it and, and always come out of it uh, alive here. Yeah. So I think get comfortable with really facing rejections because, well, when you're trying to sell this story, you'll probably see hear a lot more no's than yes, unless you are a seasoned entrepreneur with, you know, a good 
kind of uh, you know uh, success stories or street cred you know that you have built you know successful companies and sold sold them before but really i think uh get get comfortable hearing no more no's than yes um you know if you hear nine no's and one yes i think that is already a very good statistics you know 10 percent saying yes i think that's great um but you know keep going like, i think I, I remember when our very first fundraise when we did it uh i probably went to three to four hundred investors um before getting you know that 10 percent to say yes and eventually uh, closing the round you know after about four or five months yeah. mm -hmm. and then what did you find uh you know with subsequent fundraising you know it's it's once you take outside money and it's a, it's like a path that you're on and you have to keep going with it uh did you find it easier after that kind of seed stage round to go into larger rounds uh and subsequent rounds or uh was it even more difficult at that point Right, I think there's every fundraise has its own challenges because at every fundraise, the, the type of investors that you need to talk to is slightly different, and also um, the kind of metrics that you need to show within the organization is also uh, different. So, so I think at the very early stage, it's really about your team, yourself, whether they believe in you, um, and as you go up, you know, uh, into maybe the Series A stage, um, really is around you know whether they find that you have a product to market fit and that you and that with their money you're you have a plan to scale um and yes there's still probably a lot of challenges maybe you you have product to market fit within one segment or one geography but you're trying to expand to another one uh, or another geography uh you know i think that there will be challenges with every segment that you go into and every geography that you go into and it's, it's for you to show that um you have the capability to de-risk um that because of the, some of the successes that you've achieved within the very first segment uh, that, that you have achieved that you have achieved product to market fit and of course as you go into series b you know gets into the scaling portion um you know uh, and and i think every single one of every single fundraise is, is different and has different challenges in itself uh. but what i would say is i think it's very important to bring on your first set of investors or early set of investors that are very supportive of the company um, because in many times they are your biggest advocate because they have been with the company they have seen how you execute and uh, you know when new investors come in, they tend to also want to get reference checks, right? Not just from your own board, but your own shareholders, but also from what uh, they hear in the market. And I think these uh, early investors who who support you um, are some of your biggest advocates um, along the upcoming uh, different fundraisers. Right. We're gonna open the floor to Q and A, and I, I see there's some Q and A already in the chat. Uh, and I'd like to let people know if you if you have a question, you want to actually ask it to Anthony directly over audio, just say, hey, I got a question and I'll unmute you and then you can engage Anthony directly or you can just type it in the chat uh, in the Q&A tab there and we'll just read it out. But uh, before we get to Q&A, Anthony, I wanted to talk about, you know, the impact that COVID uh, has had on the business. And you alluded to it earlier, given, you know, the tie ups with the vacation rentals and just what a hit that market has taken. Mm -hmm. um, personally, for your business, when all of this was Kind of going on in in march 2020 where it became very apparent that this was going to be a global pandemic and it's going to be pretty bad uh or even earlier i guess in singapore uh how much did you really worry like that you know the business could really suffer and it might not make it through was that something that came across your mind uh and how did you guys adapt and, and come up with a game plan to not only survive it but actually kind of thrive through it and expand mm -hmm. into new verticals right um, for sure, I think like 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 with every company, um, there was so much uncertainty in the market. Um, so you know, a lot of companies started to hunker down and really you know kind of streamline down the value proposition as well as the product lines and the focus within the market so that um, they can last, right? Because as with many you know organizations, how the if if you can last through the pandemic and come out of it, you know, I think you have a much better chance of succeeding subsequently. So when, when the pandemic first hit us, um, the, the biggest uh, challenge that we faced was really on the operation side because uh, China was the first to get hit by the pandemic. A lot of factories started shutting down. Uh, work from home was uh, kind of imposed. And because we do have a manufacturing base out of China, it meant that we are not able to produce products. Um, that also meant that we are not able to ship products and clock revenue. So I think that was the, I think initially the biggest uh, challenge for us. And, we went through a couple of months uh, of, of this really just, um, you know, just with revenue grinding to a halt, you know, within the first half of 2020. But I think uh, the efficiency of China being able to 
you know, contain the virus within their own, within their own country. Um, the offices started opening up in the second half of last year, especially from Q3 and Q4. Um, and we, we saw factories started reopening again because we were not the only ones that were affected. And I suppose, you know, there's, it's impossible for them to keep factories closed for extended periods of time because there will be so many businesses that, are, that will be affected, given that China is kind of the factory of the world, right? So, so I think we, we rolled that back up again uh, in the second half of last year. And uh, of course, there's still many challenges going on right now still. Um, like, for example, freight causes continue to rise. Um, there's electronic components that continue to rise as well. But what we have put in a lot of effort over the past 12 months is really to secure good partners and good lines of uh, chipsets so that we can, you know, pre-purchase, bulk purchase them and, and to secure shipping lines as well so that we can get the products to our customers uh, on time and uh, the right, 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 right place. Lah. Yeah. Um, I think the second thing that we faced uh, was on the top line as well, um, revenue wise. So many of our distributors were also very worried at the beginning. So many of them started working from home. So definitely there was disruption to businesses uh, in itself. But we, what we realized as you know, uh, the pandemic uh, went on is that many uh, of our potential customers or our customers uh, realized that they are not able to you know, keep their businesses closed forever. Right, they need to come back to work um, and need to maintain their operations and they need to continue to run the business. If not, you know, many people will be put out of jobs. And we saw, uh, you know, really our developed markets coming back very strongly, um, especially countries like the US and Europe, uh, regions like US and Europe, where uh, many of our customers started opening up for business again. And, and with the whole concept of you know going contactless uh, because you know people don't want to touch the physical key for fear of the virus, um you know it really helped to accelerate the adoption of our products within uh, some of these developed markets. Uh, some examples would be you know we we have you know vacation rental partners that came back quite quickly to you know uh, to to accept demands of local travel because people are stuck from home and they want to travel and they cannot travel overseas so they travel within their markets. Um, like in France, in Europe, uh, in, in Germany or in Spain, um, they travel to different parts of it. And, and so the local vacation rental market started coming back again. And so without being able to pass physical keys, they started adopting the keyless access solutions like from our, 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 our products uh, in a much quicker fashion. We also have different use cases that popped up. Um, there was this very nice uh, kayak rental company that's based out in uh, Scandinavia. Um, and, you know, Pre-COVID, they could have someone there to get the kayak to the individual for them to rent. But during the COVID period, they had to go completely without without uh, someone there to, to pass the keys. So they completely went, uh, you know, it's, it's essentially no 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 maintenance stuff. Like, yeah. You just make your booking online. You go to the kayak rental company and you get a pin code from Eagle Company. You enter the code and you can rent a uh, self-rental of the kayak. And many of such businesses started to pop out and uh, we supported, you know, I think all these businesses will come back alive uh, again, right? Um, to serve their clients. Um, in fact, I think during uh, early this year, we, we saw this huge boom in housing over in the US. There was a massive trend uh, where uh, many people, because of working from home, they started to leave the cities and move towards, uh, you know, kind of the Sun Belt area where, you know, like for example, in Phoenix and Texas, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and so on and so forth, where land prices is relatively cheaper, you get a bigger house, and yet you can work, uh, and you can work remotely and have a much better uh, living. So, so uh, you know, real estate agents uh, started, you know, working overtime, really to show the properties and allowing individuals to come to view the, the properties and transact properties online. And, and keyless access became a very important component of the entire process. So there were a lot of opportunities that came out during the pandemic, which we believe that will stay for the long term, um, you know, because once you go keyless, you're not going to go back to passing a physical key again. You know, it's, it's a very good catalyst uh, for the business. And we saw our US business and European business grew by, you know, about two, about two times over the past 18 months, despite the pandemic. And us having, you know, wrapping back to the operations, but us having kind of secured the lines of shipping and, you know, our factories being back up again has really helped us, you know, write the kind of the tail end of the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, coming coming back up stronger than 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 we went in with, yeah.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like the pandemic, you know, it did cause some initial uncertainty, but it also provided a number of opportunities for you guys to and you're able to capitalize on those. And, you know, I mean, the housing boom in the United States, for instance, and just realtors, I mean, I remember, you know, kind of the old school way of doing things where you go look at a house, there's a lockbox on like the, the, the door handle that with a code and then, you know, the thing right. put in there, you got the key. And, you know, that's something that's uh, kind of like the pre-digital area. Um, we're going to open the floor to questions right now. Uh, so anyone in the audience, if you have a question, you want to just type it, uh, we'll read it out loud, or you can say, hey, I got a question, and we'll unmute you, and you can engage Anthony directly. Uh, but we do have two questions uh, right here in the chat, so I'm going to read them out. Uh, Su Ping Lim uh, says, Anthony, uh, it seems that partnerships have been essential in scaling your business with Airbnb and SG government bodies to organize smart city events. Yet many entrepreneurs have been deterred by knocking on doors that would not open. I'd appreciate it if you could share your experience on how best to approach and seal deals with potential partners. Thank you. Right. Thanks, uh, Siu Ping, for the question. So I think uh, for us, as we went about doing this, is uh, like uh, I think similar to the fundraising story, right? I think you get a lot more no's than yes. I think it's really to keep going. As long as you believe that the product that you bring to the market has a value proposition to the organization. So if, if there's a value proposition, a strong value proposition to Airbnb or property developer or you know any of these uh, en enterprise customers that you are trying to work with, um, you you will be able to get someone to listen. And you know if the value proposition is painful enough, um, they will pick it up. And I, I the way we think about it is usually uh, across three dimensions. The organization must be uh, ready, willing, and able. Right, so if they are ready and willing but not able, it means they may, might not have money uh, at the point in time, or they might not have the technical uh, capability to work with you. Then you know the door will not open. If they are willing and able but not ready, you know now is not the right time for them to do it. Maybe because it's their AOP period or it's a budgeting period, then you will not get the door. The door will not open as well. But if they're ready and able but they're not willing, maybe because they have their internal struggles or whatever, um, you know you also will not get the the the, the deal across the table. So um, I think there's a lot of uh, nuances that needs to be there, but I think it's, it's really about never giving up and really um, keep going out there to find the partners. I think one example that I can share for us is that, you know, yes, we have certain successes in different segments, but uh, one of the segments that we have found a lot of struggles with really uh, is in the data center segment. So we, we have a great value proposition for the data center because I, right now during the pandemic, there were a lot of uh, data centers being built because everything is going digital, right? So uh, we, we felt that, hey, you know, uh, if data centers are being built, every data center, there is like 50,000 server racks. They need maintenance and you can't imagine them holding 50,000 keys, right? <laughs> to maintain all the server racks. And we have the product to supply to these data centers. And, you know, I think across the period of 12 months, we knocked on, you know, at least 30, 40 different data center providers. Really only one came back. Um, and after a while, you know, we, we, we also do realize that maybe the value proposition to these uh, clients might not be as strong as some of our other segments, and we have to put that kind of a lower on priority. So I think I have a, have a you know, really a deep, uh, you know, thinking internally whether is the value proposition strong enough, is the client that you're working with ready, willing, and able, and, and just keep keep going from there. Now, what we can do uh, is also, you know, I mean, it's, it's also good to connect right after this uh, session offline and if there's particular organizations that you would like to connect with uh you know through maybe some of our network we can also help out and i think i think probably that's also a great uh you know a value proposition from this startup grind right that entrepreneurs come together share network and share some of these experiences yeah mm -hmm. yeah help others uh give first make friends that's what we're all about at startup grind so uh yeah su ping a great question and you know i just would echo what uh anthony said which is uh, that, you know, you're going to get a lot of no's more than yeses, and you just kind of have to kind of uh, have pound the pavement and, and just keep going. No, never be deterred by a no. So, and Su Ping says, thanks, Anthony. I'd love to connect offline. So, yeah, we do appreciate that. Uh, and that's that's what we're about at Startup Grind. Uh, po Sing Tang has uh, another question. Hi, Anthony. Thanks for your sharing. Can I check how did you find the right designer slash engineer to help build the prototype? Very good question, because when you're trying to get that you're in the hardware space, uh, which, you know, for, for startups is a tough space to be in sometimes to build that MVP and get something to market. So how did you go about building that prototype and finding the right uh, designers and engineers? Um, sure. I think thanks. Thanks for the question, Po Sing. 
Um, I think uh, I don't really have a good way to answer this. I think we uh, was kind of lucky that the initial team that we have uh, really uh, have a lot of uh, you know different various values that they bring to the our skill sets that they bring to the team. Um, our CTO, who is our, essentially was the one that started building the first prototype, uh, was the previous CTO of Hungry Goware. So he has he himself has a good network of engineers that he could tap into. And in fact, some of our early hires were really from his network of people that he has worked with uh, before, you know, in the ecosystem for the past 15 years that he could bring on very quickly to help to build the initial uh, prototype uh, together with myself. Um, our designer is this uh, lady called uh, uh, Kai Hui, who also was someone that, you know, we have worked with before in previous uh, organizations. I, I suppose it's really from uh, the network that I, I, I and my partner have built, you know, really before starting this company um, through the, you know, couple of other projects that we have uh, worked on uh, together. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's really putting the word out there that, you know, this is the project that you're working on um, and seeing who aligns with your, your, your vision and having them uh, join on board. I think probably, you know, some of the mistakes that people might, might have at the beginning when they choose their first, or at least they put together the first team is to identify, find people who are too similar to them um, that, that kind of cause an issue probably later down the road. Sometimes it's good to find, you know, uh, individuals who are uh, a little bit different, um, share the same values, but all bring the different skill set to the table. Um, it's easier said than done, uh, but I think, you know, writing the initial founding team uh, that you put together is extremely important to help you get the first prototype to sell the, the mission and the vision of the company and the team to the initial set of investors um, and, you know, grow, grow from there. Yep. Very good, uh, very good insights there. Um, uh, we'll, we got uh, some time for a couple more questions, uh, so we'll leave it open there. But one question I did have, Anthony, you know, you talked about that data centers and some uh, kind of different areas of the market where you guys can come in and some that have uh, very, you know, kind of secure information or important uh, levels of access. Um, because this is digital and, you know, this is not the old uh, kind of just key and lock. Uh, it is something that is susceptible to, to hacking or, uh, you know, potential nefarious actions by uh, others. How do you prevent uh, and get people comfortable uh, about uh, a digital lock and, you know, reassure them that, you know, hey, this is something that can be trusted and is not something that could fall prey to uh, bad actors? Right. Um, great question. Uh, I think security is something that we think about a lot, uh, not just cyber security, which is, you know, the online security, but also physical security, which is security of the lock itself. And security really sits on a spectrum, right, between convenience and security. The more convenient that you want, the lower the security, but the high, you know, higher security, it means that you are putting a lot of barriers up and you might lower the, the convenience uh, factor that you want to bring to the market. So the way we think about it is based on the different customer segments that we go into. Some customer segments have lower requirements for security. Some customer segments has highest, you know, uh, requirements for security. An example will be an Airbnb uh, host, because uh, as an if if you're an Airbnb host and you're really willing to open up your property to a stranger to come to your house, you know, maybe with insurance, um, you know, you are already more on the the other side of the spectrum where you really want convenience. You know, there's nothing really in the house that you know you, you you're worried about. You know, you are trying to rent out the property and have turnover probably as quick as possible and as convenient as possible. And then on the other spectrum, you know, if you're talking about the military use cases or oil and gas, where every asset that you're trying to secure is very of high uh, of critical infrastructure of high value, then security of uh, both hardware and cyber security is extremely important. So we differentiate that uh, this way. And of course, as we go into, you know, customer segments that require a lot more security standards to put in, um, you know, what we do is we put in a lot of effort into our cybersecurity standards. Uh, at the same time, we also work with um, different uh, regulatory bodies or at least government bodies or, you know, pen test companies to, to work with us to make sure that at least uh, we are, you know, uh, protected to a certain level of degree that is enough for this um, segment. For example, we, we are accredited by IMD in Singapore for some of the standards of security that we put into the, the the product so they go through the you know accreditation process they do you know black box te testing they also do code reviews of our solution and i think they also help us in the way we protect and you know secure our our products um i think not, nothing is ever uh, non-hackable you know it's just how long it takes 
to break into the system and how much barriers you put up. And I think it's important uh, that, that this message is also driven across to all the customers, but you try to put in as much effort as possible, you know, through the, through the process. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a very good point is uh, nothing, nothing's perfect. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we don't live in a perfect world, sadly. Uh, Su Ping's got another question. Anthony, what's your perspective on commercial property sector in Asia, especially given the rise of hybrid working? Thanks. Sure. Um, I, this is a, and this is, a, you know, an ongoing discussion within the company. Um, I think the rise of hybrid working really has, you know, I think in the U.S. is the biggest uh, change, right? Where where a lot of people are starting to buy bigger properties, um, and so we, our, our business started picking up significantly, especially within the realtor space. Uh, if I understand, if I understand your question correctly, you're thinking about hybrid working across both home and at work, right? So how do we secure some office space as well? Uh, you know, for for you know, kind of on demand hot desking kind of purposes. Uh, so I I do think that we have office. Uh, uh, you know that that really pick up our solutions, especially some of the co-working spaces across Singapore and some of the in, within the region. It is not a high priority market for us at the moment, uh, but we do have glass door solutions. You know door locks that are you know some of these offices can can use. As at the same time, we have a so dashboard solution that enables them to manage you know people coming and going. Um, it's just, it's just not a super high priority uh, market uh, market for us at the moment. But we do think that, uh, and one of the reasons really is that uh, if uh, depends on the depends on the exact country that you're talking to, like for example, like in Malaysia or in Indonesia or in the Philippines, we continuously see a lot of lockdowns, uh, and you know with new variants coming up, I think the different countries are still grappling with the right measures to reopen their economy in a you know in a responsible manner, right? Where we, what we have seen right now uh, is you know European countries as well as the United States or North America, you know, being open for business, they have the right infrastructure put in place uh, to battle and combat any new variants that come out, you know, in various degrees of success, but they, they do have infrastructure in place. And that's where we feel that, you know, as a company with limited resources, uh, that's where we are kind of putting our uh, focus on. Um, but us being based in uh, Singapore, we do have very strong network of distributors across Asia Pacific. And once we feel the pulse of businesses coming back online again. I think that's where we will start uh, doubling down on, on those businesses. Yeah. Good insights. Uh, that's uh, about, uh, and Su Ping says thanks. Um, Thank you, yeah, we're, we're about at the end of the hour, so uh, if there's no more questions. I think that's a good good spot to leave it at. But Anthony, thank you so much for coming and sharing your insights uh, at Startup Grind today. Uh, talking to our community, um, you know, we really appreciate it. Uh, you guys are in an interesting space. You're doing uh, amazing stuff and have grown quite a bit in the last six years and uh, we wish you nothing but continued success and and do come talk to us again sure thank you for this thank you for inviting me thank you so much and right. thanks everyone thanks, for everybody and have a great rest of the day